Hi, welcome to Stories of Art. My name is Karel Huidekover. Today, let's have a look at this wonderful painting of the legend of Lady Godiva. It was painted by John Collier between 1880 and 1898. But before we get started, let me get this out of the way, because if you enjoyed this video, then please give me a like. It helps my channel. And you could, of course, also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And you can also share it with anyone you think might be interested. All you do is copy the URL and paste it in anything, in an email, WhatsApp or whatever. It would be nice if more people get to see this sort of content, don't you think? Now back to the story of Lady Godiva. It was a very popular story, at least in the 19th century. It played out in the 11th century, that is, if it ever happened, which is highly unlikely. And it happened in the earldom of Mercia. But in the 19th century, this story became very popular because of a poem written by Alfred Lord Tennyson in 1842. And because that poem was so popular, many an artist made a painting or a sculpture of it. And we'll see several of them in this video, but this one happens to be my favorite. But first, a little bit about the painter. John Collier. He was an English painter who worked in the pre-Raphaelite style. That is to say, he was not a member of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, but he did like a number of their principles, and mostly he was interested in the kind of stories from the period before Raphael, so the Middle Ages, basically. Here, by the way, we see him in a portrait painted by his wife, Marion, who was an accomplished artist in her own right, who sadly died much too young, so we don't have that much work by her. He, by the way, then went on to marry her sister. But because that was illegal in England, it was illegal to marry the sister of your late wife, they had to go to Norway to get married. Anyway, John Collier's work has been called part of the historicism movement, which was very popular in Victorian England. And in that movement, artists often went to great lengths to try to depict historical scenes accurately. Painters like Collier would often study historical costumes and objects and, and try and get things historically correct, which in this case he did as well, even though the story isn't really an historical story, as I mentioned before. It's a legend, but one that has deep connections with the city of Coventry. In fact, you might say it's part of their founding history. You see, Lady Godiva is an historical figure who was married to Earl Leofric, and together they more or less founded Coventry. So here's a little bit of background story. Mercia had been a kingdom during the earlier Middle Ages. It formed after the Romans left, and although its border shifted throughout the centuries, it is mostly the Midlands of what is today England. At some point during the 10th century, it was reduced to an earldom, which it still was as a more or less independent realm until the Norman invasion of 1066. And after that, it was still an earldom, just not as independent as before. Now, the story takes place in Coventry, which today is a sizable city in the English Midlands. Now, as I said, Coventry was more or less founded by Earl Leofric and his wife, Lady Godiva. Before their time, there had been a Roman settlement and then another settlement that formed around a nunnery that had been founded in about 700, but both had been thoroughly destroyed by the Dane king Knud, or Canute, during his invasion in 1016. And in 1043, so almost 30 years later, Earl Leofric and Lady Godiva built a Benedictine monastery on the remains of the nunnery, and eventually established a market nearby, so the town was gradually resurrected. By the way, historically she was probably called Godgifu, which in Old English meant something like the gift of God. Godiva is the Latinized version of it. She died somewhere between 1066 and 1086. This is kind of relevant because the first mentions of her story are in the middle of the 12th century. And basically that is the extent of the historical part of all of this, the bits that we know that actually happened. Of course, none of that explains why we have a picture here of a naked lady on a horse. But that is kind of her claim to fame. She famously rode on a horse naked, but obviously not for fun, but for very, very good reasons. Now, about a century after she died, a chronicler by the name of Roger of Wendover, who was a monk in St. Albans Abbey, wrote her legend down. 
So a considerable amount of time had passed between the supposed events and the time when Roger Wendover wrote them down. So plenty of time for a legend to grow. So we have to take this with a number of pinches of salt. But it's the basis of the legend and over time bits and pieces were added to it until finally in 1842 Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote this famous poem about it and that is the inspiration for all these 19th century paintings and sculptures. So what was the legend? It was that the Earl wanted to raise taxes, but people said they couldn't afford it and they would starve. Lady Godiva then took up their plight and asked her husband to reconsider. And he said something along the lines of, what are you complaining about? You don't care about these people. But let me just read the relevant part of the poem by Lord Tennyson, because of course he said it much better than I ever could. She told him of their tears and prayed him, if they pay this tax, they starve. Whereat he stared, replying half amazed, you would not let your little finger ache for such as these. But I would die, said she. He laughed and swore by Peter and Paul, then philipped at the diamond in her ear. Oh, I, 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 you talk. Alas, she said, but prove me what it is I would not do. And from a heart as rough as Esau's hand, he answered, Ride you naked through the town, and I repeal it, and nodding as in scorn. The painting you see here, by the way, is by Edmund Blair Lighton. He chose to depict the discussion where, after he said this, the Earl, her husband, walked away. In the poem it's even mentioned that he walked away with his dogs, and that detail you can see was added by Lighton to this painting. Then Tennyson goes on to tell us that she spent over an hour debating with herself what she should do, but then her pity won. Notice, by the way, her very long hair. Here she has it in braids. That detail is there to show us that, according to the story, she had very long hair. So now she had to ride naked through the town to make her husband change his mind. And she did, but first she sent a herald out to inform everyone she was going to do this and ask them to stay in their houses and not to look out of their windows. And this everyone did, at least according to the story, as written by Roger Wendover in the 13th century. The story also tells us that the Earl kept his word and did not raise the taxes, making her a hero of the people. And that is what we see in this painting. And as I said, my favorite version of it is the one by John Collier, not just because she's so pretty on that horse covering herself in her hair, but also because of the horse itself. Just look at how proud the horse seems to be to be part of this operation. That expresses that although she is embarrassed, they are actually in the middle of their triumph. Now we see Lady Godiva sitting astride the horse, and that's kind of odd. You would expect her to ride side saddle, which is the way you see the most paintings of the scene. But of course that wouldn't work for the picture in this case, because if we want to see the horse from the side and she would ride side saddle, then she would either be sitting with her back towards us or she would face us directly. So either we would only see her back and barely see her face, or we would see her frontally, which would make the picture a lot less modest. Like it is in this painting. This is actually the earliest known painting of the subject. It was commissioned by the Coventry Corporation back in the 16th century. So clearly it was already a story that was part of the legends of the city. Here we see her riding through the empty city, but there's a little detail up in that corner there. One person is looking through the window, and it could well be that this painting and this detail is the first instance where we see Tom. Some have even suggested that the idea of Tom, the addition of it to the story, originate in this painting. Now Tom was, according to this addition to the legend, the one man who peaked, but was severely punished. In the poem by Tennyson, his eyes shriveled up and fell out of his head, so he was blinded. And he is forever known as Peeping Tom. And that's the actual origin of the word or phrase, Peeping Tom. Now the story of Peeping Tom and his painful fate is also part of the Lord Tennyson poem. But we don't see him in the John Collier painting, even though there are plenty of opportunities for him to hide in one of the many windows there. But clearly that's not part of the story that is depicted here. Here we see the triumph of Lady Godiva, with her looking modest and embarrassed. I mean, it wouldn't be much of a sacrifice if she didn't care about all of this, but the horse is showing us how proud he is. There are various details here on the horse that I should mention. There's of course this elaborate saddle and 
I'm not sure what you call it. Is, is it called a is it called a horse's blanket? The the red covering on the horse. Anyway, you see the lines that are stitched into it in what I suppose is meant to be gold thread, and those same lines are also visible on this sort of heraldry on the reins of the horse. And there you can see they're alternated with these other sorts of three little crowns. Now I would love to be able to tell you that Collier went out of his way to to find the heraldic emblems of the Earls of Mercia, but in reality, real heraldry didn't develop until much later. So it looks nice, but it's probably not very historical. And the architecture that we see in the background, I think is also not entirely correct for the period. You see, most English cities, and indeed most cities in all of Europe, were made almost entirely out of wood. Some palaces and monasteries and churches, of course, would be made in stone, but it was still a very expensive and difficult process for people. Building in stone became much more usual in the next few decades after the Norman invasion, though. But here, it probably makes the city look a lot prettier than 11th century English towns would have been. But hey, the point is to make a pretty picture, isn't it? Now, today, Lady Godiva is still very much part of the identity of Coventry. There are statues of her in the city, this one for instance, and there's even this, the, the Broadgate clock in Coventry, which of course is a 20th century thing, where I assume on the hour she repeats her famous ride. And above her you can even see Peeping Tom. She's even featured on the flag of Coventry. And they have an impressive collection of paintings of the subject at the Herbert Art Gallery and Museum, which is exactly where you can find this one. Now, before you run over there, let me remind you that you could subscribe to this channel. It's free, it's easy, all you have to do is hit that one button underneath this video. If you also hit that bell icon, then you will be notified anytime I post new videos. And it would also help me if you leave me a like to this video. Again, it's just one click. And I would love to hear from you in the comments which of all of these Lady Godivers is your favorite. Anyway, thank you very much for watching and see you again soon.